I don't actually use water in my cloning process because I'm pretty assembly line with it when I take clones. It's in, in, you know, to where they're going. The only thing I do after my 45 degree angle is a light, light abrasion, um, actually upward on the kind of surrounding stem area from that 45 degree angle. And even with aeroponics, if I wait too long and I mess around and I have hydro plants, that transition into my cocoa blend with peat is a little bit of, you know, they get a little wonky on me. You know, they might shoot a yellow leaf or two. They might get a little upset with me. It's the quickest way if you can get it dialed in. If you if it's not dialed in and you're having fluctuation and everything, it can be a headache and make you feel like you don't know what you're doing. What's up everybody? If you that don't know me, my name is Chris, aka Mr. Grow It, and this is Garden Talk, episode 9. This episode's guest is Trey Strongs. He is most known for his YouTube channel, Cannabis Lifestyle TV, which currently has 278 videos that have over 11 million views combined and 124,000 subscribers. He is also the host of Elevated Chef, which is an infused cooking show, and he owns a hydroponic shop in Michigan. In this episode, we talk about the basics of cloning, all the way from how to cut clones, the environment that clones should be put in, different ways to clone, and more. Before we get into the episode, I'd like to give a quick shout out to our sponsor. Big thanks to Happy Hydro for sponsoring this episode. They actually recently launched their own YouTube channel and they're posting videos on a weekly basis. Aaron, who is their host, he puts a fun spin on grow light reviews. They're also doing part tests, unboxing videos, and how-to videos. Do me a favor and show them some love. Go subscribe to their YouTube channel. Be one of the first subscribers to that channel. I'll link it down in the description section below. And of course, you can always check out happyhydro.com for popular brands like AC Infinity, Grow's Choice, Spider Farmer, Chill Tech, Gorilla, uh, Blue Mat, and more. That being said, let's get into the episode. All right, we're here. What's up, Trey? How you doing, man? Doing all right, brother. I'm uh, excited to be on the show today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Uh, you've been requested by a few people, and um, of course, you're part of the CLTV family. You know, you and Rob are, do are doing big things over there. I had Rob on actually the first episode, which was last year, and uh, you know, on that episode, I think is the one where people are like, oh, we need to get Trey on here. So finally, got you on here for one. So thanks for coming on. Yeah, of course. Yeah, well, I was gonna say time flies because I feel like that was like last month you know that he was on on uh you know on your channel and i but i've seen it i've seen that video pop up quite a few times so you know all i can hope is that i i do uh some 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 sort of uh diligence to him who came before me representing the the cl fam so you know um <laughs> no yeah pressure, happy to no be pressure. here <laughs> yeah of course <laughs> uh okay so to start um for those that don't know who you are, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of how you got into growing? Yeah, so uh, I'm Trey. I, I'm passionate about family cannabis and culinary. Um, so all subsets of my life come from those passions. And um, obviously uh, is why I have been dedicated to Cannabis Lifestyle um, and Cannabis Lifestyle TV and all the things that have branched off from that. But really I've always from my first interaction with the plant i've been like the plant not necessarily the flower but the plant have been fascinated by it i guess you know it's like the closest thing to a hobby that i have <laughs> but it, for the longest time it wasn't really you know something you outwardly was like yeah my hobby's growing cannabis you know um it's cool to say that i've i think i can proudly say that we've been a part a small part in that footstep of like breaking the stigma and having it be kind of somewhat normalcy to you know have that small at home garden and just figure out on how different ways to tweak it and make it better um which is what i've been doing for the past decade so yeah, I mean, I that's me in a nutshell as far as cannabis and and you know obviously if any of you have you know watched the channel you know um, I have a good a great relationship with culinary which I've melded with cannabis many many times over which I also feel like is another subset of those two passions of mine so 
And you also have a hydroponic store, is that right? Yeah, we, uh, uh, North Shore's Hydroponic and Holland Hydroponic Outlet, one and the same. Uh, we're located in the West Michigan area, West West, West Coast area. Um, so, yeah, we got four locations along, along like a 60 mile strip. So, we've been helping people. Store's been around 11 years. I've been a part of it for about seven. And,. <laughs> that'll put you through the trenches you know <laughs> of just like even if i wasn't growing kind of the do's and don'ts and the the, the wheeze and won'ts you know <laughs> so it, that's been it, it's like an apprenticeship almost in a sense again because you are in a time that it wasn't as trendy as it is now um so I, you know of course you you have those instances where you know, people are kind of driven for one sense or another uh, towards gardening. And so you find that kind of ugly side of it. But there's a really great gardening community out of it as well. And I think what's cool, and I'm sure it's like that with like the automotive community or any niche uh, interest, right, is um, you kind of have to work your way into it. And 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 your name is really all you have to go by is what the community says you are good at or not so good at. So I haven't had too many bad reviews in the sense of that community. So uh, for me, that that's a sense of pride for sure. And uh, you know, I think that's why people come back to us because you can get you can get gardening grow equipment from anywhere. Um, but the knowledge that you seek for your garden at the time of need, you know, that's what makes you so much of an influence on not only YouTube, but just the growing community. And, you know, that's what's going to kind of speak volumes over time. That makes sense. Cool. All right, let's get into the topic today. So let's talk all about cloning. Um, so I have a variety of people that watch my channel, right? Beginners, intermediate, advanced. I, I feel like it's more geared towards, um, I feel like a majority of the audience are, are beginner-like. So in this episode, I really just want to kind of cover the basics. Maybe we can get into more advanced things in a different episode, uh, but let's cover the basics. So um, first off, what is cloning? Well, <laughs> it's essentially uh, keeping around whatever form of plant you have um and essentially by cutting off a, a piece of that plant and and trying to have that established roots or you know a root zone so that you can um keep keep whatever it is you got going so yeah i think that's in the simplest form cutting off a branch uh and rooting it is really what it comes down to so um at, at what point do you clone uh, i mean do you take clones in early veg late veg flower when do you take clones um <clears throat> i would say you know when i read that question i'm like well like mid veg <laughs> that's not you know i'm not not papa bear not mama bear and middle or not baby bear and middle bear so um i would say i like to have a, a plant be well established i guess before i i I take a clone. So I, w I would say I'm a mid veg, not early veg. Cause I feel like, and they, you know, depending on, you know, the resiliency of your plant, you may not need that long a time. And again, depending on what kind of plant you're cloning, I'm sure everyone has a little bit different of a sweet spot. But for me, I would, I would say mid veg. I usually do mid veg as well. Um, you can do it at any point, right? Or early veg, you can do it. Maybe like, I would say probably the earliest I would ever take clones is around day 20, 25 ish. You know what I mean? That would be like real early to take clones for me. Um, you can definitely do it in, um, in late veg. You can do it in flower as well. Some people don't know that you can actually take clones in flower. It's called uh, monster cropping. And then you, you have to actually go through the, the re-vegging process. So it takes a little bit longer to, to, to get back into that re-vegging process and take off. But you can certainly still take clones uh, while in the flower stage. It's just, it's just not really ideal because it takes a little bit longer than that. So. Yeah, I saw that option, and I'm like, mm, not, not for me, not, <laughs> but not, not personally. And uh, we um, just uh, touched on this actually on our live, I believe on Tuesday. You know, there's a, if you, you know, it can 
again be whatever i know certain like orchid strains or even um there's a customer of mine who clones conifer trees and he gets like six hundred dollars a clone and he'll take like six hundred clones and he'll only get six though you know so it's like not the greatest succession rate but um i would say i just don't want to go through that much time and effort and energy and left it it's like the cream of the crop worth that monster cropping and um revenge time because the revenge time can be quite a long time completely agree situational right uh, so some people aren't going to have the space um you know to have an 18 six light cycle a veg light cycle going and a flower cycle so maybe they they put all their plants in a flower then they realize hey this pheno is awesome i want to keep it mm. So at mm-hmm. that point, maybe they, t- they, you know, they cut clones at that point, um, you know, late flower uh, to kind of keep those genetics around. So, yeah, I agree with you. It's definitely situational for sure. So can the plant be showing deficiencies when you clone it? <laughs> well, you, you bring up a, a good adjective there, situational, which I feel like is going to be kind of a couple of these answers for me, um, which it is. Uh, you know, again, those those trench in the trenches days that I mentioned, like just shown me like the really – and I guess that's great because we've built a community and kind of a, a existence on this. But there's no one answer, right? Um, I, I, again, if it's if it's a phenotype or a cultivar that is just, and I for whatever reason don't have any other way to keep it around, and it has an issue, it's it's showing signs of stress. It's you know maybe has <clears throat> some sort of pest issue. I'll clone it, you know, if if it's coming to kind of a T in the road. If I had my, you know, perf- if I had my perfect situation, I would wait for it to be healthy, to bounce back. Because obviously those issues are only going to translate down into that generation. And so it's going to be dang near impossible to um, kind of supersede those issues if they are so severe. But, you know, if if a... If a plant is showing me signs of that it's probably not something i'm keeping around to be honest but again dependent on the situation um yes but like initial answer no (laughs) yeah i think there's i think that's a common argument is um if the plant is showing any type of deficiencies it's, it's showing a sign of weakness you don't want to clone i think general knowledge is you don't want to actually take clones at that point now I've read quite a few books, and one of the things, I have some notes here. One of the books that I've read, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, The Grower's Bible, Jorge Cervantes Grower's Bible. Um, So actually in that one, uh, quote, clones quickly develop a root system when the stems have a high carbohydrate and low nitrogen concentration. So there is an argument out there that if you're a little bit deficient in nitrogen, you're actually going to root faster, which I thought was really interesting. Now, I've never put it to the test. I haven't done any side-by-sides or anything like that. But, um, you know, for those people who think that any sign of deficiencies is a weakness and you shouldn't clone at that point, there is actually some evidence out there or for people out there, experts in our field out there that are saying that if it's a little bit deficient, uh, you know, particularly in nitrogen, that's actually a good thing and actually speed up rooting. Um, well, I and I was going to say, when, sometimes when you take a clone, they will obviously show signs of nitrogen deficiency. So almost having a plant that might already be established to that, you know, might do well, you know, because depending on, you know, the, the length of time it takes your plant to develop roots, you know, it usually you are not hitting it with a bunch of food. It's not having a bunch of access to resource necessarily. So... You know, it's almost like, you know, a kid that's been in the streets already, <laughs> you know, so it's like they're going to survive a little bit better, you know. I guess <laughs> I've done no side-by-sides, but I have been in that situation where actually a couple months ago I had I didn't have to shut down the garden, but I had to revamp it and I had some genetics that I wanted to keep around, but they were a little stressed because I was pretty focused on my greenhouse at the time and so uh, you know i took i took those plants that weren't so great and i cloned them out just to keep the um cultivars around and they cloned (laughs) so i i mean you know jorge knows 
quite a bit. I, I, I'm familiar with the Bible. I've obviously referenced it a ton. I think it's like the Bible. I haven't run it from like cover to cover, but you know, <laughs> I've definitely referenced it. And, and that's interesting. I mean, you don't think about these things that you've done necessarily in the, in the garden until you, you know, are talking about it. So makes sense. Now for probably one of the most, uh, beginner questions very common beginner questions i guess i'll say can you clone an auto flower plant oh uh, yeah <laughs> i went into my own conversation with this question like off camera <laughs> like, I was like, well first of all <laughs> um auto flowers man i was gonna say because i've never done auto flowers because that, that's my initial like nope don't do that you know uh don't grow that here um it's tough, man. I have done them. The ones that I've grown, I have not been very impressed with. They were just kind of there, and they did their thing. I have done a couple sun-grown as well, um, and where that's where I feel like they have the most value, uh, personally, for the region in which I uh, grow, as well as the type of gardener that I am. Um, I've heard of people doing it. I haven't personally done it. I don't personally run auto flowers. I'm gonna try to get better with that because they didn't. They haven't actually done anything to me personally, but it kind of feels like it because when you dedicate time and energy to a plant and it comes out like Charlie Brown Christmas tree, you're like, what the heck is going on here? But that's uh, kind of what I, you know, I'm the, that's the type of guy I am too. Like, I didn't do so well with them. I will probably pick up that challenge again. You know, if the situation uh, opens itself to it. Um, but as far as me cloning auto flowers, no, I have not. Can you, there has been people out there that have successfully done. So I don't believe that that's what they were inceptionalized to do though. They were, they were developed to do exactly the opposite of that, to, 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 to be planted, to grow, to bloom and to die. That is what they're meant to do. How you tweak that cycle is very pertinent, <laughs> and I haven't gotten it down yet personally. So, um, but there are gardeners out there. I have a couple customers that that's all they grow and and they love it, and they're they're doing pretty well from what I can see. So, yeah, I think technically you can um, you can clone an auto flower plant. Now, is it ideal to do that? Are you going to get a, a great result? Are you going to get a high yield high yield from doing that? Probably not, right? Because if you're cutting a clone, say you cut a clone around day twenty five, right? Um, typical auto flower is going to start flowering around what day 30 day 40 or so it's on that uh, certain lifespan right um, it's not like you control the amount of time it's in veg by the light cycle like you do with photo period plants right so if you're cutting a clone around day 25 off an auto flower plant you can get it to root for sure you can get it to root um, now the thing is it's going to be flowering pretty quickly because it's not sensitive to that. It's not, you know, photo periodism. So you might have a small plant. So then it's like, well, is it, is it even worth it to clone autos or, or not? So uh, technically right. it's possible, but yeah, you got to ask yourself, is it, is it really worth the time? Is it really worth, you know, the space? Uh, maybe it is for some people. I'd love to know uh, for those who are viewing this, have you cloned an auto flower plant before? Do you, is that something that you practice? Let me know. Let us know down in the comment section below. Sure. Uh, I'd love to hear it. I'm sure we'll hear somebody that says, oh, yeah, I clone all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there are those not anomalies in the system. But like I say, there's gar gardeners out there that make things happen that I don't see in the, the, the mass percentage or popularity. But it's definitely, you know, done. For sure. So when you do cut clones, does the clone need to be a certain size? Do you have, like, do you cut a certain size of a clone or, or what? <laughs> um yes would be like my golden boy answer <laughs> um but like do they vary yes as you heard me uh, mention a couple minutes ago i've taken whole plants and turned them all into clones so that you know the size the size differentiation there is going to vary um ideally um, when I clone, I take same size clones so that they all grow evenly, um, is my thought process behind that or why I do it in that method. Um, but it kind of varies too. If I have 
different um, phenotypes or cultivars next to each other in the same cloning bed, then they vary. Uh, no matter what size I take them at, you know, certain uh, genetics are going to root faster and grow quicker. Um, I had some uh, plants that were in my aeroponic cloner that pretty much turned into hydroponic plants. <laughs> so it's um, it's not impossible uh, to to have success, I would say, uh, without keeping it the same size. I think it helps you if you try to, um, just like in cooking, you know, you want to cut things to the same size so that they all cook evenly. When you have it more uh, kind of rough, it's going to cook that same way. So That's a good answer. I think for me, generally, what I'll do is... <laughs> You know, roughly maybe six to eight inches is what I'll cut uh, for a clone, uh, roughly. Now, there are people out there who have uh, cut off two-foot branches and then clone that. I mean, it's possible, <laughs> right? You can do that. <laughs> I, I, I have. I have. It, it depends on if I'm breaking down a plant, if I'm, you know, just trying to, to take an even. I, I try to be even about it, but it, it's situational. Again, I'm going to steal that word from you for this <laughs> episode. But, yeah, I, I try to. I usually will cut like a decent size off of the plant and then shorten that into a clone. So I go for fairly that same size, but they, some of them vary, you know. Got it. Now I know you said that you've taken clones from an entire plant before, right? But generally, what part of the plant do you take clones from? My entryway into cloning was, you know, bottom of the, bottom of the canopy, you know, um, or lower half of the plant and so that's where i try to start at but sometimes i wouldn't say sometimes majority of the time when i'm taking clones i'll look at that plant and then also start to like prune that plant so if there are certain branches that i'm going to discard anyway they might become a clone in the process so there are those times but most of the time it's because i'm snipping you know clones off of that branch already so um, usually the lower half of the plant, I would say, is like my 80% go-to unless I'm breaking down a whole plant. Got it. Yeah, so you can definitely, um, you know, just to back up a minute, you can definitely take clones from any part of the plant if you want. Uh, but I am going to actually quote Jorge Cervantes again. You know, in you his go. book, he has just this section on cloning. And, and I remember when I first read it, I was like, wow, I didn't know this. I didn't know this. I didn't know this. And and one of the things was, was clones from the lower branches root the easiest because they contain more of the proper hormones. So that's what it says in there. So basically the lower part of the plant is apparently the easiest to root, has the newest hormones. Middle part of the plant, easier, easier to root, next to oldest hormones. And then upper part of the plant, most difficult clones to root, oldest hormones. That's coming straight out of his book. So I thought it was interesting. I figured I'd bring that up. I'm not sure if a lot of people know that or not. Um, there is some stuff in his book that's inaccurate. So can't say well, that think, this is 100% accurate, but um, yeah, that's what it says in there, which I thought was interesting. Right. No, there's there's so much information out there. And I I think, too, again, because I grew my uh, in gardening terms, I grew up off of Jorge Cervantes and Ed Rosenthal and, and guys who learned strictly off of them. Um, but again, that was a different time. That was, you know, almost two decades ago. So I think there's just been so much more revelation and information and science done um that any plant you know that, that cuts across more than just ones we may be talking about um it, it's there's a lot of things like you say that can be inaccurate now or debunked in a sense but um because that same thing i've had clones root from the top of the plant did they take a little bit longer i mean i didn't take a record of it but probably so Interesting stuff. Now, when you cut the clones, a common technique is to cut it at a 45 degree angle. Do you do that at all or? I do. <clears throat> yes. Um, that's, you know, when I go to take that longer piece of the plant and I snip it down, that's when I make my 45 degree angle. And so. the benefit of that is? The only <laughs> information bank I have is, is from my mother. Um <laughs> who ran a floral shop for many, many moons, many, many moons before I was a thing. And um, where I get a lot of my kind of green thumb from. And every time she would bring fresh flowers into the house, which she always had to have, uh, she would always cut it at that same 45 degree angle, you know, every single stem. 
and I think you know it does expose surface area. But how she explained it to me is there a, for for those plants that they were able to more readily uh, drink or eat or like go for resource in the vase that they were in. I think the same thing applies when you're talking about taking a clone. Is you wanting a fresh as most as you can get it as close as you can get it sterile part to that plant to start that root zone from. Um, so that's my two cents. <laughs> now there's a common technique of basically at the end of the clone to split the end, uh, and it supposedly gets more roots that way. That's a common thing. Another thing would be to scrape off like the inch or two of the bottom of the clone. Um, again, to kind of help with surface area, help with, with rooting. Do you do any of those techniques at all or? I do not. And I, I and I, and there's nothing wrong with it. I think people do, there's definitely gardeners out there who get success from doing that. I, I wasn't ever taught that from my kind of Obi-Wan into, into gardening. Um, but also I just, I, the time or two that I've done it, it's so much stress on the clone that I haven't seen good results come back from it. I haven't seen it be beneficial to one my rooting time or two just overall health of the plant um i have had a couple people help me clone and when they they've gone to do that and i'm like oh <laughs> it's like pretty nerve-wracking um but no i i i, I the only thing i do after my 45 degree angle is a light light abrasion um actually upward on the um kind of surrounding stem area from that 45 degree angle and then i dip into my rooting hormone or rooting compound and um go from there so uh yeah that that's worked for me it's it's i think it's just enough ruffling on that edge to get that oh crap we need energy here which is what you're creating when you when you take that clone um but it's not so much that it's hard for the plant or for the potential plant to recover got it yeah i usually i usually scrape the bottom inch or two at the very bottom um you know with the hopes that that roots would be popping out of that place i've seen them i've seen it happen before you know as they ripped mm -hmm. out you can see roots coming out that way so i think yep. it's beneficial so that's that's typically what i do uh, i don't think i've ever from when i can remember i don't think i've ever done the split at the end um I don't think I've ever done it before, but maybe I have. I don't know. So, well, I don't yeah, remember I guess every I, single plant I've grown, every single thing I've done. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. We, had, we, didn't, we weren't recording every single time that we did it. We were just, I mean, a lot of my early garden career was just throwing crap at the wall and hoping that it stuck, you know what I mean? <laughs> but it's, um, I think we can both agree that the, the scraping or the light abrasion is beneficial, um, how you go about that. I guess I wouldn't say... I. The only thing I would say I don't do personally is like completely scrape it down to kind of the meat, which is what I think could be translated from the question. Um, not that you can't do it. They're, you know, plants are pretty freaking resilient. It's kind of crazy what they go through with what we put them through or otherwise. So um, you can do it successfully, I think, as far as like cutting into that, like upwardly and not just doing the scrape or doing both. But I think favoring one or the other. You know, it's just a lot for the plant to recover from. Now, after you cut the clone, it's generally advised, I mean, just about any resource you read online, it's advised to immediately put that clone into water. Is that something that you do? Um, you know, what are the reasons why to potentially dip it immediately into water? Um, I got the answer here if you need me to, <laughs> need me to give it to you. <laughs> yeah, go ahead and give it to me. <laughs> All right. Um, so... You want to prevent air from getting into those hollow stems. Um, it's called emb embolism. Um, so basically, it's a bubble of air that gets trapped in the stem. Uh, when that happens, fluid stops, and then the clone dies. So that's why it's generally advised to just stick that clone directly into water to prevent that air bubble from getting into the actual hollow stem. Um, so that's okay. my understanding of it. Yeah, I mean, learn something new every day. It, the, what I know is that again it's it's keeping it sterile i guess i didn't know exactly about the the air bubble effect but again to me it's a contaminant factor you know and i i understood that fact of um 
Like, you're taking these clones, you want it to be sterile from the cut all the way until it's in whatever medium you're putting it into. And that can help. One of the people who was helping me take the clones was making the cut actually underwater and, you know, cutting it upward and things That's like that. Way. And yep. I just, no, I ain't got time. <laughs> you know, I, I, could, I, I have success without doing all that. Uh, the only thing I would say I use water for is if I'm, hey, these need, I need to um, take clones of these uh, cultivars. So let me take the branch off and stick them in a solo cup with pH water until I'm able to take the clone. That's when I will kind of soak my cuts in water. I don't actually use water in my cloning process because... I'm pretty assembly line with it when I take clones. It's choo -choo in, choo -choo in, you know, to where they're going. I don't have like a a span in time where I have to necessarily worry about that. And I know some people, instead of going into water, instead of dipping it directly into water as, as quickly as they can, they'll go directly into a rooting hormone, right? So, so what is a rooting hormone? Uh, that was what I was going to look up, but I believe it's like, Embryogenic acid or something along those lines. I mean, I know the homie Goblin, he uses just like um, aloe vera. Um, and I know there's a couple of, of gardeners that practice that actually. I know there's some people who don't use a rooting hormone at all. Uh, but what is it? Um, look it up because I, I know I butchered that word, but it, it's some sort of acid in, in a gelatinous form, more or less. <laughs> yeah, quite simply, it's, just, it's something that's going to help the, the clone root faster is really what it comes down to. Um, there are several different types. Um, we won't get into two details. It's a little bit more advanced, but NAA, IBA, DPA, IBA. Yeah. Um, those are three different ones. I usually use the IBA ones. Um, then you've got the you know the liquid solutions versus the gel solutions versus the powder solutions. Powder. Are there any ones in particular that you usually do? Oh man, uh, <laughs> I guess what no. also what brand? Not, not in particular. Brand? I don't have a particular brand. The, the reason I chuckle is because certain customers are so dead set on like Clonex. Oh, you don't got Clonex, and I'll have Root Tech instead. You know, just because sometimes the inventory varies, right? And um, <laughs> it's like Lucky Gym socks to me. I'm like, it's it's rooting gel. What is the difference? You know. Like when you get a new cloner, you get easy, uh, or yeah, easy clones version, which is a rooting compound. I've tried Dyna, I've tried Root Tech, I've tried cloning. I haven't. I don't think I've actually ever even used Clonex cloning gel. I haven't because it's purple and it weirds me out. But um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've had success with all the ones I've mentioned, um, and I don't, I don't see a difference personally. You know, coming from a guy who runs a hydro shop four days out of the week, I don't. There's no difference <laughs> to me personally. I think the only thing I would add to that is I usually use like the, the liquid or the gel. I feel like the powder, um, you know, sometimes oh. it doesn't get directly onto the, the bottom of the clone as nicely as the the liquid or the gel does. See, I feel like that's eluded me because I've had customers come in, you don't have any rooting powder? And I'm like, mm, no. Like that's a dated, in my opinion, form of, of doing Taking clones. I, I don't even stock a rooting powder. The The closest thing to a rooting powder I have is Great White. You know, shout out to them. Uh, because once I dip into my rooting, um, dur -dur -dur, rooting hormone, um, I then will roll my, my clones into Great White. So it almost creates like a paste on the end of um, my clone which is also why i don't use any water or anything i feel like everything that gets sucked up into that little situation ship right there uh is you know a combination of that uh rooting hormone and and great white because great white is like powdered sugar it it cakes okay so there's several different methods for rooting right you can simply cut the clone off the plant directly stick it directly into the medium which i've done in the past uh, of course, using, you know, rooting hormones, which we just talked about. You can um, stick it in rock wool. You can use root riots, aeroponics. Um, you can actually stick that clone directly into a cup of water and leave it in the cup of water and it actually root in that water. Um, what method do you typically use? Well, I haven't ever had 
roots come from just sticking it in water. I know people who have, but I have not had that amount of green thumb action personally. But other than that, I've done them all. <laughs> I, well, except for Grodan. I haven't personally done it, but my brother who I garden with now, he, he uses them. And they're they're just like any other soilless cube. I, I think there's a little bit of technique when you're talking about soaking them. Um, I started my cloning career in root riots or soilless peat cubes. I find those to be personally one of the more beginner friendly or less vulnerable ways to clone. Um, personally, um, the only difference is kind of how I've graduated to how I do it. I used to just take them out of the bag, take the clones, stick them in there and go. Um, now I will typically soak them in a solution that has some form of great white or orca um, in it because like I mentioned, I do the dip and roll in my aeroponic cloning. Um, that does not work so well when you go to shove something into a peat cube with a hole that's really tiny. So I just make sure that the great white is just already absorbed into the puck or the peat cube. Um, and then go from there. Um, aeroponic cloning. Uh... When she works, she's a beaut. When she doesn't, it can really be a punch to the gut. Um, that's uh, my other, like, binary relationship with any kind of hydroponics. <laughs> it's like, it can be great, and it, if it's bad, it can be very bad. Um, but if you can get it good, it, it, it is, like, one of the most streamlined ways to clone. I think that they're happy that way. Um when you're talking about the other spectrum, just like taking it off of the plant and sticking it into like some sort of dirt. I've done that too. Um, I've done that when I'm like, if you make it, you make it. Bye. You know, <laughs> that's, that's kind of how I've, how I've done that form of cloning personally. Um, but I know a lot of gardeners who that's just how they do it. Um, again, a plant is so resilient. It, you know, you can have success with it in any of those forms of that I've talked about, or you know, drop in the comments. Maybe other ways that you've cloned. I know customers who clone on the plant. You know, um, so it's there's a lot of different forms. But you know, going back to just sticking it in the in the dirt, just like cutting it when you're making that cut up the plant. It's a lot for your plant to overcome. So your your root time, your root development time, I just have found personally to be so far extrapolated from kind of the more primitive way of going about it that that's not how I practice my gardening because it would just be so stunted and and not consistent and not perpetual and that's the whole reason that I got into cloning is so that I could keep certain cultivars or phenotypes around that I could keep the garden perpetual and keep growing and keep hunting and 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 flowering so um I think aeroponics are has been the best in that sense the most streamlined um I have had certain phenotypes that just do not take to that well so you have to venture into other areas um whether it be sticking it straight in or or using uh soilless cubes so it, it's situational <laughs> can we get like five cents every time we say that um but <laughs> yeah so i i think you know when you're talking about preference aeroponics for me and right next to that you know tried and true for me is is going to be the soilless peat cube um, I've had people see, or seen people have really great success in the grow dance. I just always used to call those things black magic cause they didn't make any sense to me cause they were not always as popular as they are now with Instagram and everything. But, um, I think what's nice with those is it allows you the ability to go into any kind of medium. So that's the other thing is like when you start a, a, a clone in a peat cube, you can go into soil fairly well going into hydro. Okay. With Grodan, I've seen them that that transfer shock be a little less, and even with aeroponics, if I wait too long and I mess around and I have hydro plants, that transition into my cocoa blend with peat 
is a little bit of, you know, they get a little wonky on me. You know, they might shoot a yellow leaf or two. They might get a little upset with me um, versus having that transition be more mild. So, it, it, again, it's it's genetic plant dependent, but gardener dependent, but, yeah. All right, so digging a little bit deep into aeroponics, um, what should the pH of the water be? And, and do you actually use a solution? Like you mentioned Clonex earlier. Uh, do you use anything in the aeroponic machine as far as solution? Solution, uh, for me, it's just a little, mm, a little bit of orca and... Not really. Not when I when I when I initially set up my my cloner. As time goes on, I'll add um, clear res. I'll add a little bit of Clonex solution. Um, I just I had some I had some issues with my with my thirty two site and and I never used to you have to use Clonex, but my plants or my clones have just seemed to. Again, maybe because it's having that little bit of food in there, giving them a little bit of energy to use for what they're doing. But that has seemed to help me if I add that a little bit later on, along with some sort of beneficial microbial in there, um, usually some f liquid form. Again, I, I used to do great white in there. I used to have a whole, not concoction, but I, I felt the need to dial it back, you know, simplify it because I wasn't seeing the same success results that I was from you know, blending, I had like kaolin and great white and this and that and there. And like, while all those things do help your root process, like they have a time and a place. So I've just found that that has helped me like to gradually add it, not make a big old solution that I'm running from jump. So is it a specific pH that you do or no? Um, yes. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I, I try to stay around six. I used to have this like battle where i wanted to be at 5.8 but six is good <laughs> got it and then i know for aeroponics some people just have the sprayers on 24 7 some people put it on a timer so it comes on every so often what do you do for that personally i've never put my my aeroponic cloner on a timer i do know a couple of uh, grower buddies who uh, one of them he he has it on a timer he sees he doesn't see good results if he doesn't have it on a timer so he stays with that method pretty consistently another buddy uh put his on a timer thinking okay i'm gonna this is the cheat code right and he just it wasn't really successful for him uh so he ended up kind of taking that element out um yeah I, I i just keep them running i i just those those pumps in there don't like I personally, I don't, I haven't seen them like to go on and off and off and on. I even, when I'm not using my clone or have it running, uh, it's got just a solution of, um, highly concentrated hydrogen peroxide in water, but it, so it's just cleaning itself constantly, but I don't let those pumps dry up or dry out because they, and obviously if a pump's coming on, it's not going to dry out, but those things are just so, so finicky. So, okay. Now. Typically, what light cycle do you place the clones under? 18.6, 24, 24.0, 12.12? 12, 12. Um, 12.12. 12. Um. <laughs> I think people do that, right? Are there people out there that put it on 12.12? 12? I think they do it for a short period of time, and then they, they switch to 18.6, I believe, or, or veg oh, light cycle. Oh, okay, okay. I Interesting. Think. Yeah. Let us know in the comments if you do it. <laughs> right, right. No, I, I'm 18 and 6. The only kind of, like, light schedule they're on is when they i'm that first week i kind of tuck them away from the light because i just don't feel that they need direct light you know um i have a small uh chill tech led mini so like it's perfect for cloning and i turn it down but i even like cock the cloner away from it just so that it's not directly in that light you know obviously season depending because like temperature and things play a role but um i've just found that they it's almost like you know you take that first week to sleep from recovery or whatever you know <laughs> like they don't need it right up under there and then once they you can see that they're you know I, I throw them under there and give them a decent amount of light on that 18 and 6 so yeah i usually do 18 6 too and that was my next question is how much light um, do you typically give the clones and then, you know, talking about spectrum, is there a certain spectrum that you like to give your clones in particular? Yeah, I, I, I was running under their mini red and I, I mean, I had results. I, there wasn't, 
a single problem. But just the 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 you know whatever we or excuse me, uh, plant guru in me was like, there's a reason why you have veg and bloom spectrums. <laughs> you know, as a, as a guy who runs a hydro store, I'm just like, okay, you know. So what's up with your guys' blue spec? So because I just I feel like if you're if they're more established plants, you can play around with different spectrums and even like. Uh, infiltrating some more red spectrums right because as spring like the almost time that we're in now comes around you get a bit more of those coming in than you do from winter you know even or or for instance right um so i don't think it's the worst thing in like uh mid to late veg but early veg i like to have that that blue green springy spectrum so got it yeah when it talks about how much light typically you know if we're talking par in PPFD in particular, I usually aim for like 200 to 400 PPFD for my clones. Um, a, a little bit less than that, it actually can get away with, with the rooting process as well. Now, as far as the actual spectrum, I do like to give it a blue. I, I mean, we know that blue inhibits cell division. That's going to lead to tighter node spacing. Um, that is uh, something where you generally hear that for the veg stage, you want more blue in the spectrum. For the flowering stage, more red in the spectrum. I typically do go more on the blue side of things when, I'm, when I have clones underneath it. Now, as far as the environment, let's get into that a little bit. Um, in your environment, what do you typically aim for the temperature and the humidity to be when rooting clones? So for like when I'm rooting my soil cubes, it's a little bit different for me than when you're when I'm, when I'm rooting my rooting in my aeroponic cloner, just because when I'm rooting with the soil cubes, I keep them underneath the humidity dome almost the entirety that they're rooting. So that environment that they're directly in is probably closer to you know the tropical environment, eighty degrees and you know seventy degrees or sixty degrees humidity. So because I'm spraying it every day, I'm I'm keeping it very moist in there, so they don't have to search for uh, water uh, of any sort. Uh, and then with my aeroponic, and with any clone, I should say like the the environment should 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 match that to a degree dialed down you don't necessarily have to keep i don't keep a dome over my aeroponic cloner i i do know gardeners who do um i don't personally but i then want to keep that area very inoculated to that germination like environment where it's you know 70 78 degrees and pretty humid because those little ones love that type of like a just you know encapsulated environment you know to do what they need to do so temperature i usually aim for is between like 75 and 82 degrees fahrenheit is what i usually aim for when i'm when i'm rooting clones uh humidity you know above 65 percent um you know up to up to 90 percent for the like the first day or so for the first 24 hours i mean if it's 90 95 percent for the first 24 48 hours um i've actually had pretty good luck doing that as well and as i read in books as well as as a technique uh but yeah kind of above the 65 percent is kind of what i've had best luck on now some people i know they monitor also the the temperature of the medium i like i mentioned briefly earlier is cutting a clone stick it directly into the medium that's kind of my primary way of doing things it's just easy for me i don't have an aeroponic clone or anything um, what i usually aim for for a, a soil level temperature or soil temperature is between 72 and 82 degree fahrenheit now, i have tried to the, probably the biggest fail um, is whenever I try to clone and all of a sudden the temperature is too low when it's in like the soil, the medium temperature is like in the 60s. It just, it doesn't root anywhere near as fast. Like you'll keep the plant somewhat alive, but it's just not going to root and you'll see deficiencies. At least that's been my experience doing that. So um, I know you said you mostly do the aeroponic side of things. Is there a specific um, water temperature that you go by? Well, I was going to say it, but I didn't want to jump into your question too far. But um, the temperature above shouldn't drastically be different from below. Um, if your below temperature is drastically below above, then, you know, you have these weird plants that try to, you know, shoot their roots upward because the roots want, you know, again, that inoculated warm environment. So for my aeroponic cloner, I try to stay in that like 70 to 72 degree 
water temperature. Anything lower than that, I have slowed root growth. I, I have no root growth dependent, and that's why it's hard like to use the aeroponic cloner successfully in 100% capacity in like the dry, uh, hot, because you have the heat on winter, <laughs> um, you know, or cold, dry winter. Um, and then, you know, in summer, I usually have great success cloning, but you don't necessarily need <laughs> to, to be doing that much in the summertime. So, um, it's kind of a give or take, but I would say, you know, I use, you know, water bottles to regulate in the, in the summertime when that pump creates too much, uh, warmth in the same sense, you have to stay kind of regulated to get those roots exactly how you want them to be in the time that you want them to be when you're talking aeroponics and you know sounds like you're having the same um you know having to regulate with soil and with the root cubes for i don't pay attention to temperature too much but i just stress to myself and my customers that you keep them moist because once they dry out it's just so hard to recover from that yeah, this, and that's the seedling mats are very helpful. Um, they got to be be careful because I've placed my uh, cups directly onto the seedling mat, uh, mats and just fried my roots. Right, it's just it becomes too hot. There is a temperature monitor on some of these seedling mats, uh, so you can get more accurate as far as what it is. But um, it, your seedling mat, if you have one without the uh, the temperature monitor on it, you know, placing towels in between that can help so you don't fry your roots uh, because it won't root if the temperature is too hot right i put a I, I screwed myself in an aeroponic because it was cold and it was on a metal surface and we insulated but it was still too warm so um while it would have been too cold without it it was too warm with it and we got root sludge and it was not good so makes sense so it is definitely important for sure so generally speaking how long does it take for a clone to root <sighs> situational no 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 um <laughs> uh, uh depending on cultivar the only re that's the only reason why i say that that was my only eh, i don't know it depends uh when i seen that question um just probably personally because right now i'm having an issue with my wi-fi um <laughs> she just does taking her sweet time i tell you what whereas i have other uh cultivars genetics that just you know they're almost like too quick you're like well dang i needed like two weeks <laughs> before you were ready you know so it's seven days like i'm not ready you know so um i think that's pretty typical seven to seven to 14 days some people like to say seven to ten and it really depends on what a root is to you because like certain people will think that what I call like the color flowering of the root or the stem, uh, where it's just about just about to shoot out those roots. They'll call those roots. I call roots roots. So I mean that just depends on who you are, um, because even once I see roots come out, I want them to be well developed um, before I transplant them. So that makes sense. I think the method also will will determine how long it takes to root. Right? If you're sticking it directly in the medium, I don't think I've had roots any sooner than 10 days i mean 14 days is typical for when the, you can tell the plant has rooted and now new growth is starting um you know sticking it directly into the medium now with an aeroponic cloner i mean can't you get some I've seen some people get roots in like six days or something like that six yeah five, i've heard six days uh, uh, i've heard four days so up. it's like i don't know i'm like well, i don't know what kind of again black magic you're using <laughs> 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 but i mean they could just have a really good environment i mean it it just can 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 come down to that it's not nothing they're doing it's just you know the, the 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 genetic or phenotype they have is just a quick rooter and a quick cloner and they have the perfect environment or you know maybe they just are really that good but uh, yeah aeroponics that's why i say it's the quickest way if you can get it dialed in if you if it's not dialed in and you're having fluctuation and everything it can be a headache and make you feel like you don't know what you're doing so for sure. Well, I think we covered a lot in this episode. So let us know, how can the listeners find you and uh, what do you have upcoming in the future? Oh, man. Uh, well, definitely check me out on Instagram, uh, Troy Strong's 420. Um, check out elevated.social, uh, which is all things, you know, like I say, uh, culinarily derived. And uh, that's kind of what I've been focused on 
uh, more recently. I have a couple of uh, IGTV serial series that we're starting up as well over there. Um, obviously, check me out on Cannabis Lifestyle TV. Um, as you guys already know, because Mr. Grow it is rapidly becoming a part of that family as well. Um, so happy to have him there as well. And Absolutely. uh yeah, I mean, I'm I'm everywhere, man. Shouldn't be too hard to find my face, especially if I'm being requested on a channel that uh, you know, I've only popped over to a couple of times, you know. So that that's what's up, and I just appreciate everybody, and and be sure to like and support this channel, comment, engage. That's you know how you can support, and and appreciate you as well, Mr. Grow. It. Thanks, man. Well, I will definitely link your channel and your Instagram down in the comment section below. No, well, not comment section, description section below. I always <laughs> say that. I always mess up. Um, and uh, so, yeah, feel free to head on over there. Give him a follow. Subscribe to his channel. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, thanks again, Trey, once again, no for problem, coming man. on to the show today. Appreciate it. Oh, yeah. You guys know what it is. You know, I sign off with the Stay Lifted because that's what we do. Peace, man.